It may come as no surprise that Malcolm Gladwell once considered a career in advertising because Malcolm himself has become something of a brand, a brand that's all about talking about what we think we know about a given topic. So let's say race or crime or marketing, taking that thinking and turning it on his head. He's done it with a trifecta of best-selling books, The Tipping Point, which explores how ideas and behaviors can spread like a virus, Blink, about how we're able to think without thinking, and Outliers, in which he explored what it is that runs through the blood of super achievers, like number 99, or Bill Gates, or The Beatles. When I was younger, so much younger than today. Now, Malcolm, who is also a must-read journalist, star lecturer. We think that things we make can solve our problems, but our problems are much more complex than that. And one time 1,500 meter high school phenom back when he was 14. Well, that Malcolm has got another Gladwellian book. And yes, that's an adjective. This one's all about giants, underdogs, and misfits, simply titled David and Goliath. Yeah. I'd like to welcome out to the program the wonderful Malcolm Gladwell. I'm very well. I love this concept, dude, of paradigm shift for people, which you perceive as a disadvantage and making it an advantage. When did you first become interested in that? Well, I, I met a, a couple of years ago, I met this software mogul. Um, he's from India, and he, he told me the story about coaching his daughter's, 12 year old daughter's basketball team, and how he'd never seen a basketball game before, so he started doing his research, and he was totally baffled by how Americans play basketball. And he didn't understand why. We're baffled by the how Toronto team plays basketball. Yes, I know. They're, <laughs> Canadians are very familiar with this bafflement. But he was in America. And so he didn't understand why people would, why, the, why one team after they scored would always run back to their own end and wait for the other team to bring the ball up. And was, he didn't understand why you didn't play full court press all the time, yeah. every inch of the court, particularly if you were bad. Because if you were bad, why would you let the good team do the thing that made them good, which is pass? And, and his team was bad. They were yeah. terrible. Um, and so he said to his girls, look, it's pointless for us to learn to, for me to try and teach you to shoot or dribble or pass, because I don't know how to do that, and you're, you're terrible. But <laughs> we can... It's quality parenting, Malcolm. We, no, he was totally genius. He was like, but you know what we can do? We can just play this maniacal defense. And so he just taught them to do this yeah. for the entire game. And they went all the way to the national championships, yeah. winning games by scores like 6 nothing. I feel like you walk into the room and people... You go, uh oh, here comes the smart ass. He's ready to come after us now. You mean with respect to me? Oh, yeah, yeah you do not want to be cornered by me at a cocktail party. Yeah. That's, it's just the worst. Uh, you don't, it's really a bad idea. <laughs> I, I really try to get people to kind of just stay away because this is not going to end well. <laughs> I'm going to be like jabbing you in the stomach. Where does that come from? <laughs> this? Yeah, that, just that, that thing in you. I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I'm exaggerating. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually a very, no, I mean, I'm largely actually totally misanthropic. I don't even like talking to people. Yeah. Um, I, uh, well, listen, you're quite good at it, so your second language is working. <laughs> yeah. uh, where does it come from? I mean, I have... Listen, I grew up in small town Ontario. I now live in New York. I have a massive chip on my shoulder, the best, best kind of chip. You know, a chip is a terrible thing to waste. You, you should... <laughs> You have to kind of... I heard that you and your buddy, was it Terry, said that the, the best way to be punk rock and to be a rebel as a kid in Canada at the time was to be conservative. Yeah, no, so we... My mother very artfully had foreclosed every avenue of rebellion. Um, there's nothing I can do to possibly rebel except to become a Reaganite, which I briefly did in my... I had, I had, a, I had, a, I had a photograph of Ronald Reagan on my wall for about three months in, in college until I realized... This is the worst idea in the world. <laughs> I am essentially making myself into a pariah. So I took it down. Your books are kind of weirdly self-help books in that there are the CEO types who write their books and the habits for successful people and the Lee Iacocas. And then there's the more spiritual base stuff. And then there's this middle group of people who are like, hey, how do I get through this? Yeah. And enter you. The moment you're in that space at all, then the backlash happens. You get backlash yeah. before your books come out, even yeah. on the concept. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Well, I mean, I'm flattered, you know, I... No, but does it suck I, at any level? It's like... Well, am I upset that 100% of humanity doesn't love me? Of course. I mean, we all want unconditional love. Um, but, uh, no, I'm not. I don't... I think it's... I mean, my books are intended to be provocative, and people are supposed to argue with it. Um, 
you know, sometimes those arguments get a little personal, but that's, that's par for the course. So when I had a hilarious experience, someone wrote this really mean thing about me in the Columbia Journalism Review. So I was like, it was kind of weird. So I emailed the writer. And what I said, did they write? Just an article about, you know, blah, 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 David and Goliath, this terrible book. Blah. But it was weird. So I emailed the woman who wrote it. I was like, have you read David and Goliath? And she emails back, actually, I haven't read it, but I've read some of your, some of your other work, is how she said. Yeah. And I was like, well, OK, that's one form of backlash right. where you don't even bother. Uh, <laughs> There's like, <laughs> they're not even, she's not in the back, you know, if you, if your backlash means that you've gone somewhere and come back, she hasn't even gone there yet. Right, yeah. It's, it's pre-lash, well, it's pre-lash. There's a whole, it's pre-lash, you're right. <laughs> Malcolm Gladwell, victim of pre-lash. <laughs> Stick around more with Malcolm right after this. All right, coming up, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Steve Jobs, Whose legacy will last the longest? We'll explore that with Malcolm next. So damn close, I can taste it. Also, Malcolm Gladwell, did a Bowie meets Kanye. Maybe the greatest thing ever happened to me. I like for art is never life wasted. Ten thousand. So, okay, first of all. That's a Macklemore song, which is great. Not only, not only did you get name checked, which is, yeah. which is one, one thing. Huge. huge it's huge. It's cool, huge. right? It's. I mean, I can. I'm done at this point. <laughs> I, wait, what's left? But he <laughs> talked about ten thousand. Yeah. This ten thousand hours thing, yeah. and I was thinking about you going. Oh my God! So many people are talking about ten thousand hours. I wonder if they even know. Like, does everybody know the whole part of that book? You've just been boiled down to. Yeah. A couple words. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, you can't, I'll take it. I don't, I mean, I'm not, I'm not complaining. Is that what? <laughs> yeah, no, just this idea that, that now this thing that you've come up with is over here. Yeah, yeah. No, that happens. I mean, when you write a book, mm -hmm. uh, you no longer own it, right? I mean, the, your readers own it. They're, and they're allowed to do with it whatever they want to do with it. That's sort of one of the lovely things about writing books is you're kind of giving gifts to your readers. All right, anthropology time. I'm gonna give you a hypothetical situation. You have to move back to Canada after a terrible incident at a literary function involving, involving politics, red wine, and rage. <laughs> Which city do you move to, and what job do you apply for? Oh, I moved to Toronto. There you go. Of course. <laughs> but which job? Um, what job? Um, oh, dear, that's such a difficult job. Well, you know whose job I want Who's? is... Um, uh, but I wouldn't be nearly as good as her. Eleanor Wachtel's job at CBC. Hypothetical situation. You need to find a new job after a horrific incident at a literary what awards gala <laughs> involving religion, vodka, and a loss of control. <laughs> Who do you cite as your three references? Oh, wow. That's a... That, three's a lot. Yes. It's a tall order. You're Malcolm Gladwell. You should have three. All right, all right, all right. All right. Well, my mom, who's going to... I mean, she's going to go to bat for me. Surely. Be, if somebody puts their mom in a reference, would you hire them? <laughs> no, I think so. My mother is a very respectable woman. I mean, she, she can make a very effective case for me. I think um, she's known me for many, many years. Um, okay, so fine. Your okay, mom so, is one. Okay, I got mom. All yeah. right. I got two others. Yep. Uh, well, Terry, from growing up, right. he, uh, he's, you know, he's a, he's a hot shot now, big shot. Yeah. So I think he, he would uh, be very effective. And you know who my, um, you know, on my, f on the, f on my, f uh, when, in college, University of Toronto, um, I was, two of my, of the people on my floor were, uh, were Nigel Wright and Jim Balsley. Two famous people. Right. No kidding. Um, so I, one Highs of the for a while and then now lows. Yeah. I know. Who are the, are the following people? Are they more a David or a Goliath? Miley Cyrus. Oh, dear. Does she have to fall into either one of those categories? Let's, can we, I'd can we not, come up with a new one? We could. You could. <laughs> what is, is twerking? I don't know how, where that fits in this whole... It's tragic. It's a, I, I was going to have a chapter on twerking, and then I... <laughs> That's I your next book. That's the Kids my, uh... Called The Kids Today by Malcolm Gladwell. Warren Buffett. Oh, Warren, I mean, I, if you've got $50 billion, it's really hard to call you a David. Isn't it? I mean, so. Yet weirdly, Bill Gates seems to be able to be the David, doesn't he? By doing such well, Bill, cool you work. know, I've said before that uh, 
Steve Jobs will be forgotten in 10 years, and Bill Gates will have statues of himself around the world in 100 years. You think that? Absolutely, because he's doing something extraordinary, which is he took this enormous pile of cash that he made, and he said, I'm going to give it away. And not only am I going to give it away, I'm going to give it away in the most intelligent way I can, and I'm going to tackle some of the biggest problems known to man. The man, I honestly believe, he is going to be one of the one of the signature figures of our generation. And what's so cool about the Bill Gates statues is it will be statues of Bill and Melinda, right? It will be yeah. this beautiful partnership of, of a family showing how they can care for other families. With the big glasses. Yeah, That's totally. the right thing. You know, big heroic marble statue of a guy with like, a little skinny guy with glasses. It's gonna be fantastic. Do, pe do people ever come up to you and go, let me tell you something, I put in 20,000 hours and it hasn't happened? It happens all the time. Does it all the time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and I just say, I, you know, I sort of shrug and ask them if they want their money back. <laughs> <laughs> what a pleasure. <laughs> Book is called David and Goliath, Underdogs, Misfits, and the Art of Battling Giants. Malcolm Gladwell, everybody.